All right. Shh. Hi, everyone. Howdy. Howdy. Well, that was good. Howdy works. Okay. Howdy's better than hi. How's everyone doing? Everyone's good. Anyone doing anything interesting this weekend? Anything fun? Engaging? No? Did, did anyone get rodeo tickets? Is anyone going? Yeah. Uh, okay. So I got two nights. So first time I'm going with my girlfriend for the opening night. It's a Brad Pays opening night. Okay. I got those. Got oh, Up in the nosebleeds, though. Terrible seats. And then I'm taking my parents to Maroon 5. Which that, I don't know which way that cuts, though. Because it's like... It's also Maroon 5. But uh, they've never been to any rodeo before, ever. Like, they are New Yorkers, I mean, through and through. I took them to a livestock show once in Los Clark in Kentucky, and my dad's like, I kept stepping in poop. I'm like, it's going to be worse. I was like, bring rubber something, toast, galoshes, I don't know, because it's just... The, the... No, but a livestock show. You walk around the yeah, by, by the arena, right? I'm actually guilty. I don't have a pair of boots yet. I've been here now a year and a half, and I, I, I need to buy boots. Anyway, anyone else doing anything interesting this week? And anything you want to, on your mind? What's going on? Shh. One voice, one voice. <laughs> one at a time. What else is going? Anything interesting? Anything? No. Yes. Wow! Congratulations. Can I come? Can I come? What, 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 is there like a gift registry or what do I bring? So you have like how many how many three year old girls running around? Oh my god! That that's not your problem. That that's Jim Bree's problem, right? right? Yes, ma'am. Who are, who are con artists? Vets or con artists? Why are they con artists? Oh <laughs> 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 right, right? Uh huh. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we need an affordable pet care act, right? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Obamacare for puppies or kitties? And, uh, actually, there's a meme about that just today. Anyway. No. No. All right. What else is going on? Anything else in your minds? What's that? <laughs> Me? How, how'd that go? Rachel was there? Good. Rachel was teaching it? Okay. Rachel, she got the A plus my class last year, so she's, she's pretty good. So listen to her. She, she knows what I'm looking for. All right. What else is on your mind? Anything else? Yes, sir. Congratulations. Wow. We need to became an uncle. All right. Now, let's get to the okay, last one. You get no credit for anything. <laughs> not, they're not required. Anyway. All right. Hmm. All right. Well, now they've got you all energized and vigorous. Let's talk about what this class has been building up to since day one. Now, you probably didn't realize it, right? But every single thing we've done to this date focuses on one topic, the right to exclude. Right? I'm going to blow your minds right now. Everything we've done has been focusing on the right to include and the right to exclude. So think of the very first case we did, right? Johnson versus McIntosh. Well, it's just mini review. All right. Uh, so, 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 so Tommy, what, what was Johnson versus McIntosh about? Very first class. What was that case about? <laughs> no? Okay. With the Indians, remember that? What was that case about? <laughs> right. So think about the case this way, right? This case was effectively about who had the right to exclude women from the land, right? The Indians were there first. Did the courts find that they could exclude the white men from the land? Mm -hmm. No. Due to this doctrine of discovery and conquest, they couldn't. But there's a double right to exclude issue. Who, uh, let's see. Um, Dylan, could, could the Americans exclude the Indians from the land? Remember, remember the key thing about the case. What were the Indians allowed to do while they were staying on the land? Could they stay there? Well, they could occupy. They were occupied. Occupy, right? 
So this case was a double right to exclude. The Indians could not exclude the Americans from the land, but by the same time, the Americans couldn't really exclude the Indians from the land. The Indians had a right to occupy, right? So let's think about this in terms of our favorite metaphor, the bundle of sticks. And I'll just use these different color markers because they're easier to see. I have also these pickup sticks, but I found that they're so small that you can't really see them in the back. So I'll, I'll use these markers, right? So we have a right to include, meaning we allow someone to come to our land. We have the right to exclude, to kick someone off. And we have the right to use, right? So in the given piece of land, the Johnson case, the Americans had maybe a partial right to exclude. The Indians had a partial right to use. No one had a complete ownership of the land. Everyone used the land in conjunction with someone else, right? And this is not rare. It almost will never happen that one person owns a piece of land 100% to the exclusion of others, unless you're some RV in Wisconsin, right? But it's very rare that this ever actually happens, right? So that's Johnson. The very next case we did, remember the Keeble case, right? This is one where the guy was with the rifle hunting near the ducks. He was blowing them up. What was this case about? He was interfering with his trade, right? He was interfering with his right to hunt. What was the problem? He couldn't keep the guy off of his land. He wasn't trespassing, but he was firing his gun nearby. Again, this is a case about excluding someone from bothering you. Okay? All of your property is, can I use the land the way I want it? And can I exclude someone else from stopping me from doing so? Right? What was the problem in Pearson v. Post? This was they were hunting on the beach. Um, uh, Lyle, did either of them own the beach they were hunting on? So how do we decide who owns an animal and no one owns the land? Rule of capture, right? The reason why we have this difficult rule of capture was because neither of them owned the land. Had either Pearson or Post owned the property they were hunting, based on the rationally solely doctrine, right, they would be presumed to own the land. So again, the fact that you can't exclude someone from your hunting uh, problem creates this issue. We studied again with the Demsets article. Remember with the Indians, they would mark off the trees where they hunted. That would be the signal is, hey, I'm hunting here. I'm going to exclude everyone else. So that's why the Indians created their own property system based on the right to exclude others from hunting their area, right? Keep going. The case we did last week, the INS versus AP case. This was a case where the Associated Press would send reporters to the field, and they'd make all these reports, and then the other newspaper would just copy the uh, stories of the bulletin board, right? Terry, what was the problem there? Again, same, same exact issue. Right, what could the Associated Press not do here? What were they not able to do? <laughs> Which right could they not exercise? Exclude. Yes. Yeah, the black, this is the right to exclude stick, okay? <laughs> they could not exclude anyone from the, taking their newspaper reports. They put their newspaper reports up on the bulletin board, remember? And the other newspaper came in and just stole it. Their going to the court was for one very specific reason. They wanted to create a right to exclude. That's what copyright is, right? Copyright is a right to exclude. It says, I create this story, and someone else can't copy it. The force of law prevents you from stealing it. So this case, again, was about the right to exclude. Uh, the other little case, the Cheney brothers, that was a kind of short case, involved the silk patterns, where one firm designed these silk patterns, and some other firm just ripped them off. What do they want the court to do? Exclude them. They want to say, we can use this property right by ourselves and exclude all others who want to use this pattern. Okay? Even the Vanna White case, right? Uh, uh, Kendra, well, well, had, the, had the Vanna White case apply this right to exclude doctrine? Yeah. Exactly. Every single case we've done, right, at its heart, has been about one person trying to use property and someone else trying to exclude them. Maybe the same person doing both. But invariably, the only way property makes sense is if you can use it and exclude someone else. Why are both these things necessary, uh, Eric? Why do you need to both exclude someone else in order to use it? Why do they both have to go together? I'm sorry? No, not a trick question. It's a trick question. <laughs> Still don't know? Think about it. 
<laughs> okay, go for that. You're on the right track. Yeah, answer it. Well, let, let me ask. Let me ask you this question. Let's go back to the buffalo example, right? Say you live in a forest, right? We did this example a few weeks ago, and you have a hundred buffalo, and anyone can come in to hunt the buffalo whenever they want, right? You have no right to exclude. Are you able to use your land in any meaningful sense? <laughs> what do you think? You have no right to exclude anything. This guy can come on, she can come on, he can come on. Anyone can come into your land. No what? You have no right to what your land? Use it. The only way you can use your property is if you can exclude someone else from coming onto it. The only way that you can meaningfully hunt is if you can stop other people from hunting there. Why? Well, because the second you stop, some other hundred people come in and take your entire population of buffalo. The right to use is very closely linked to the right to exclude. Right? Randy, would you ever buy a house if you couldn't keep people out of it? Would you ever want to live somewhere where people can come and go as they please? Of course not. That's ridiculous, right? But this is not common sense. The very nature of having a property system ensures that's the case. We have a right to exclude in order for us to use our property. If we can't exclude, what good is there to even have property? Everyone get that concept? So in terms of the bundle of stick, right, I keep pushing off this question, how we define property. We can't define it in only one sense, right? There's a right to exclude. Right? And that right to exclude gives you the right to use. The, the red one's my use stick, right? You know, I have a picture of it, much, much, a much more accurate bundle of sticks, right? There are lots of bundles, but I'm focusing mainly on a couple of them, right? You have the right to use, and you have the right to exclude. But there's another key aspect of property that we may not even think of. And that's the right to include, to invite people onto your property. Now, you might think, wait a minute. Why would this ever be an issue? Of course people have the right to include you know, someone onto their land. Well, this isn't always the case. <clears throat> so I mentioned this case earlier, but there's another famous Indian case called Worcester versus Georgia. And it's actually very similar to the Stacey Shack case. So what happened? Georgia passed a law saying that Basically, white men were not allowed into Indian territory. Why would they pass that law? Well, the white people were trying to help the Indians, give them aid, give them knowledge, give them whatever, teach them, right? But Georgia wanted to keep them separated. So Georgia said, hey, Indians, you can exclude people from your territory, but you can't invite people in. That's not a very meaningful use of your property if you can't invite people in. So you really need all three of these. And we'll see this in the, in the Shack case in a few minutes. You really need the right to, the right to you know, exclude, you need the right to include, and the right to use. You need all three of those sticks. Okay? But we say in property that the most... Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, the right to include actually uh, just waiving your right to exclude for certain You can view it as two sides of the same coin. You can do that. Yes, sir. I was getting there next. I was getting there next. I'm not done. We're building up to this. Come on, guys. All right. So, Missy stole my thunder. Maybe, maybe I'll bring some cookies for Java later. Uh, anyway. So, the basics, the very basics, right? You have the right to use, the right to exclude, and you have the right to include. Okay? But that's all well and good. Shreya, what happens, though, if, say, you find somewhere else that you want to go? You want to go somewhere else. What do you do with your land? What if you can't sell it? What if you can't rent it? I mean, it's useless. It's just going to take up space. Can you imagine a piece of property that you can't sell or that you can't get rid of? Yeah. Ooh, we'll get there in a minute. So we, we're going to do a case. I think you actually this in property two. 
So there's a case you'll study. It's, it's later, in, I think, later next semester. It involves these facts. There's a, a, basically a trailer park slot in upstate New York. And the ground is such that you can't get a sewage pipe there, and the, the soil is not good enough for a septic tank. So effectively, you can't live there. The city deems it uninhabitable. So the guy says, okay, you know what? I don't want this land anymore. Right? You ever try to get rid of a piece of land that you own? You can't get rid of it. If no one buys it from you, and the state doesn't want it, you're stuck with it. So effectively, he was stuck with a piece of land, paying property taxes, by the way, that no one wanted. You can't get rid of land. Or imagine other circumstances where a state passes rules saying that you can't sell a piece of land. We mentioned this earlier. Say you have an endangered species on your land. You can't sell it. You own it. You can exclude people from it. You can include people as long as they don't step on the little birdies or whatever. You can't really use it, but you can't convey it. So the ability to transfer a piece of land is another essential bundle in the sticks, right? So we got, ready? Exclude, use, include, and convey. Okay, so three or four, depending on how you count, are probably the main um, aspects. And we saw this in the Johnson case, right? Were the Indians allowed to sell the land they lived on? No. So it's weird. They could use it. They can kind of exclude other Indians from it, but they couldn't exclude the Americans, but they were not allowed to include. So we see in the same plot of land, these rights get chopped up, and you have part of one stick and part of another. So now let's look at it this way, right? Let's break down this right to sell, or this right to con I like the word convey. What do I mean by convey? Convey means to transfer an interest. But in a given piece of land, you can have multiple interests. And actually, Shrey alluded to it. So say you own a piece of land, right? You can rent it to someone, but you still own it, right? Maybe you can rent the first floor to one person and rent the second floor to someone else. Or, and this is where it gets really trippy, you can rent something, you can sell someone to someone in the present and sell it to them, someone else in the future. So what makes this class painful in a few weeks, right, is the difference between a present interest and a future interest. And if any of you have read ahead, you're already cringing, okay? You can't only think of property in terms of who owns it now. We have to think of when do they own it. So it's possible that, you know, I sell a present interest to Sharia, and then I, I sell a future interest to Lily when Sharia dies. We'll have lots of people dying in this class, I promise. Lots of people die because you get property in the old days. And that's perfectly fine. So Sharia has a present stick, and then Lily has a future stick. Can Sharia sell hers? Sure, she can. But. This is where you get to the next topic. Once she dies, whoever she sells to loses it. And then Lily gets it. You can only sell what you have. So property is very good to think of in terms of sticks. There's not an absolute notion to property. There are various elements of how a person is connected to a piece of land at a given time. Right? We do another case later this year involving a, uh, a campground where there's a lake. Okay? And the campground is given permission to boat, but they're not given permission to swim. Now, you might think that's stupid, but the only thing they'll give permission to do is actually to boat. So if people start swimming, they're actually breaking the law. Property can be very precise what you can and can't do. Now, Hannah mentioned organs, right? Are you allowed to use your organs? Yeah. Can you exclude someone from taking your organs? Well, I hope so. People can't rip into your back and grab your kidneys. Can you include and give someone your organs. Yeah. Yes. Actually, well, only organs you can not survive with. You can't really give your heart away. That won't, that won't work very well. Can you sell? No. No. Well, not, not organs. Plasma, <coughs> semen, eggs, stuff like that. Things that are considered renewable, right? So even, even in your body, you might have the right to exclude, the right to include, but you don't have the right to sell. So every property interest we have can be viewed through these different lenses. But usually the biggest two are include and exclude, right? Use, selling are also important, but include and exclude. 
All right, everyone, everyone get that. It's it's a it. There's no actual literal bundle of sticks. It's just made up. But this has been used for a like, you know, hundred years to help property students think of various aspects of the right. So any questions? This we'll be coming back to this analogy over and over and over again this semester. Anything? Yes, ma'am. Necessarily, fall under what? Under creation. Uh, I'm okay, let let let, let 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 let's talk about creation, right? How do you gain a property right by creating something? What what we study in the AP case and in the uh, other cases? What about the act of creation gives you a property right? I'm not talking about patents. It's been long before government, you know, long before the patent office ever opened. Why? Just philosophically, why does building something give you a right to it? No, why? I'm asking. Labor, right? This was the idea of labor theory. When you invest labor in it, you're making it your own. And what are you actually doing? You're taking elements from nature. You know, you can take some sticks and tie them together and make a bundle, right? And you're making something, and you've created that. But Lily, in the act of creating it, what have you effectively done to the rest of the world? Excluded them, right? When you've taken those sticks from the ground and made a bundle, you've taken those sticks away from someone else. By creating something, you've now excluded others from that. I'll take it one step further. The way Locke views things, governments are created to secure property rights. The reason why we have government is to ensure the right to exclude. Because imagine Lily builds this nice bundle of sticks, right? And then Jabe comes and knocks her down and takes it from her, right? It's very messy to have people going to war over stealing sticks, right? So we have government, we have civil society to mediate these property disputes. That if Lily creates something and we say she's created this, this is her property right, the government will enforce it and prevent Jacob from stealing her sticks. That's effectively why law viewed government exists. Governments exist to secure property rights. And even today, what happened with the INS versus AP? They went to the government to secure the rights. What happened to the guy, the, the two guys hunting the foxes? They went to the government to secure their rights. What happened to the, the you know, the, um, uh, the the Oregon people, right? They went to the government to secure their rights. Even now, protecting property rights is a function of government. The guys with the whales, right? Same, same deal. They went to the courts to try and vindicate their property rights because someone else did not exclude them from the uh, from the hunt. Yes. Sure. Yes. Yes, well, well, actually, that's a perfect segue into the next case, right? So, the Steinberg case, because they took things in their own hands, didn't they? They said, screw it, we're going to drive there anyway. And then what happened? They lost, big time. So let, let, let's, let's lead into this, to this, this, uh, this Steinberg case. It, it, it's, it's really short. Um, uh, Jacob, just want to just run through the facts of the, the Steinberg case? It's a pretty short case. And there was a, I think it was a home builder, and they were, they were moving a big home. Yeah, like, you know, they're like, they're like trailer homes or mobile homes. Like, these things are long, right? You ever, you ever see them on the highway, like the wide load? They're, they're huge, right? All right, go ahead. So they, they asked the, uh, the family, the jocks, to uh, pull permission across the land. Mm -hmm. and repeatedly said no. Uh, eventually, they plowed through the snow and just moved the house across their land, irrespective of the jocks saying no. Okay, right. So that's exactly what happened. They were trying to move this very, very, very big mobile home in the middle of the winter. And have you ever seen the quincy things on these roller kinds of things? They're really, they're really wide load. And they were not able to take the normal road to get to the location they needed to because there was too much snow, there was ice. They have had to invest all this other money in these kind of rollers to make sure it wouldn't stable over, and it wasn't even safe, okay? So let's just assume that, you know, it was very difficult for them to go on this road. Um, and what what could they have done to try to persuade the Jacques to allow them to cross their property? What, they what could they have done? Yeah. Mediate, yeah, and what, what, what usually involves in a mediation? What are they asking for? Money. Money, yeah. Okay, so th this is this is like Coast Theorem, right? <laughs> this is negotiation. They could have said, hey, listen. It's going to cost us $5,000 to pay for this expensive rolly truck thing, right? How about we give you less than $5,000 to cross your land? Everyone would be better off. The jocks would have more money, right? And they would be able to go buy for less than 5000 And Ricky? Good, I got it. So were the jocks interested 
in negotiating here? No, not really. They didn't care about the money. Oh. Uh, they wanted them to use the road because they, their opinion is that the roads are there. Okay. So, so here we're dealing with not rational people, right? Or, or I should say, they, they are rational, but they're they're often motivated by money, right? The, the, the opinion alludes to the fact that some problems with neighbors before we don't we don't know the history, right? But they had some sort of some sort of dispute with neighbors. So, you know, this this trailer company offers them lots of money. You know how much they offer them some money. They say no. Um, Emily, is there any actual damage to the land by uh, this company driving over? Yeah, so effectively, when there's damages for one dollar, that's called a nominal damage. Have you ever heard of that? It means there's no actual damage, just, you know, just something, right? So you can imagine this huge trailer driving over probably a foot of snow through the, you know, through Wisconsin, right? There's not, there's not really any grass there, right? There's not any crops underneath the ice and snow. There's not going to be any damage. So if we were just to look at this before we put aside the right to exclude, um, uh, Tasha? Who should have won here? Just just by balancing the equities, who should won here? Forget property for a minute. Yeah, the trailer company. Why? Yeah, I shouldn't have said they're not rational. So they are being rational, but they're not thinking about money. They're thinking about some sort of principle. Which there's really nothing wrong with principle. Um, and I, I, sh I should I should clarify that people should be able to have certain principles, but. Um, uh, Christina, what's the cost, though, of this principle to society? What's the cost of this principle of not letting these uh, people cross our land? What do you mean? Okay. So I think I think what you're getting at is they made stuff much more expensive for everyone else, right? If they had just allowed this trailer park to drive straight through, it would have made things much better for society, right? There would have been only one dollar worth of damages to the grass, whatever, and these other people could have traveled their home much quicker. Okay? So this case went to a jury. I'm sorry. So anyway, so the, the Jacques refused. And then the Steenberg said, you know what? Do it anyway. You know, I don't give a blank what he said. Just get the home in there any way you can. So effectively, the manager was saying, it's going to be cheaper for me to get sued than to go around. Right? He made a calculation. It'll be easier if they, if they just sue me for it and I, and I, you know, than going around. Did this prove to be the case uh, tomorrow? In the, at least in the trial court. What did, what did the trial court do? Just the jury, at least. Good, 100000 So they gave $1 nominal damages, right? Nominal damages, again, that's the damages actually incurred. What's, tomorrow? What's, what's a punitive damage? What does that mean? Um, it's more of a punishment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, punitive, the very root is the same word as punishment, right? It's meant to punish wrongful conduct. Right? So even though the actual damage to the Jacques property was $1, they awarded $100,000 in punitive damages. Tracy, why do you think the jury was so willing to hand out $100,000 in punitive, punitive damages here? Whose rights? The landowners' rights. To do with what they want in their property. Yes. They were standing up for their own rights. You can imagine there's some jury in rural Wisconsin, right? <laughs> and they probably also had a lot of land. And they said, I don't want anyone crossing my land. This is wrong. We need to stand up for what's right. We need to hit them over the head and give them a message. What's the message being sent, Tracy? Yeah, it's just that the rights of the individual land over the farmer are yes. greater than yes. the need of commerce or whatever. A very clear message sent that the right of the individual property owner trumps. Absolute. And if you want to try to trespass, because this effectively was a trespass, right? You're going to be burned. Okay. So, uh, Tara, what did what did the judge do with that hundred thousand dollar punitive award? Um, he set it aside. He set it aside, right? And what happened then on appeal? Uh, they affirmed what he had done, um, saying that they couldn't give back the punitive. 
Wait, say that again? I thought that they said that they couldn't reinstate the consent. Could they or could they not? What do you think, uh, Hannah? Can they award punitive damages in this case at the discretion of the jury? Yes. Why? Because um, even though there are nominal damages for an intentional trespass, you can only award punitive damages if you don't commit them. Good. Supreme Court of Wisconsin held that punitive damages may be awarded <coughs> in the discretion of the jury. Right? They don't have to award it, but the jury so finds. Now, they walk through this analysis. And where they cite the Supreme Court, there's this one opinion, okay? Highest or Aetna, U.S. We'll talk about this case. So there's a question. Is the government exempt from these restrictions with fines crossing your land necessary? Can the government engage in a trespass? Really? What, 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 what's required for the government to come into your land? Wait, so you're saying that the government can't trespass? What's required for the government to come into your land? What do we call that? A warrant. But they don't do that. Okay. So generally, right, if the government wants to own your property, you demand a warrant. Everyone know that? When they're knocking your door saying, hey, come in, you say, come back with a warrant. Everyone know that? Everyone, yes. They, I don't care what. They're knocking your door saying, come back with a warrant. Make it very clear and unequivocal. I don't care what... It doesn't matter if there's anything inside your house. Let, let them knock on your door and you can get damages. I, come back with a warrant. Anyway. It's true. I swear, I once, I once did a lecture, a lecture to a bunch of uh, eighth graders, right? On the Constitution. I told them, never talk to the police and always demand a lawyer or your parent present. This teacher wanted to kill me. She wanted to throw me out. I was like, okay, don't invite me back. But <laughs> do not ever talk to the police unless you're with a parent or a lawyer. Because they, they're not there to help you if they're talking to you at that stage. Okay. They're not. If they're, if, if they're interrogating you, they're not there to help you. They're trying to get something on you. Anyway, uh, the kids enjoyed it. They, they were taking notes. <laughs> anyway, so this is, this is, this is a, the, the unfortunate sense I have to give to the students. So... The government can't come on your property just for fun. That's why we'll do the state v. Shack case in a few minutes. That's why this is kind of a weird case. But let, let's, finish, let's finish this case first, right? So this Kaiser Edna case, it says the right to exclude, right, is one of the most, whoops, one of the most essential sticks in the bundle. This is the Supreme Court of the United States. That the right to kick someone off your property you know, the stick right here is the most essential sticks in the bundle. And for reasons we discussed before, without this right to exclude, your right to use doesn't make much sense. Now, Gina, is that actually accurate in this case? Was the Jacques' right to use your land in any way impacted by this tractor trailer crossing for five minutes? At all? Was it impacted at all? Even a little bit, teeny bit. Okay. So a teeny, teeny, teeny bit. Okay. So what the court says here is, even if this use of property interferes with like you know like 0.1 percent, that's enough. That your right to use must be 100 percent. 99.99% use ain't enough. Okay. Good. I will get the prescription later. Is that property too? So, uh, Jason, let me ask you a follow-up question. If one company crosses land, I think Gina says, like, it's no big deal. What happens if two companies are crossing his land? Where do you draw the line? Three, four, five. People just start traveling across his land for fun because it's shorter. Okay. So let me ask this question, right? 
Was the court here actually adjudicating the issue of the Jacques and this trailer park, or are they sending something bigger? Are they doing something bigger? They want to set a standard of what deterrence is. Deterrence. Like I was saying, we're going to draw the lines. Deterrence. That's the right word. So the court here wasn't just resolving the issue of the Jacques and the stupid trailer park, right? They were making a signal. They were sending a message, if you will, about how property rights should be protected. And then what standard did they take, Cynthia? I'm sorry. What standard did the court set here? Um, they, well, they, they put the, uh, the landowner's rights above the yeah. commercial rights, the other people's rights. Yeah. Yeah. They say that this right to use has no practical meaning unless it's protected. And that society has an interest in punishing, deterring these trespassers. Beyond the interest of one landowner, this isn't just about the Jacques, this is about the entire state. And I think they also are sending a message about self-help. Uh, uh, Daniel, do you know what self-help is? You probably did this in torts. Uh, oh my God. What's self-help? Uh, That's exactly right. <laughs> self-help is taking matters to your own hands, right? So here we have the Jacques. They said you can't trespass. And what did the guy do anyway? Trespass anyway. We don't like that as a society. We like rules. We like people following the rules. And the way to ensure people following the rules is to hit him with a $100,000 uh, fine for self-help. Right? Because again, say, say again, he saved $5,000 by taking the shortcut. Right, Barbara? And say a court ordered $1,000 in punitive damages. Would that be a signal? But let's 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 say he's it would have cost him five thousand dollars to get this you know the rollers whatever right, and he only got hit with one thousand dollars of damages. Would he say it's still worth it? Probably. So what the court says here is we have to make it clear that self help is not worth it. That self help is not worth whatever you do. We're going to hit you with high punitives, and this will make it clear that's not worth it. One other issue. Let's talk about the duration of the trespass. Uh, 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 David, how long was the actual trespass of this of this uh, vehicle going across the land? Maybe an hour or so. Short period of time, right? <clears throat> Should the right to use be impacted when it's only of a short duration? Um, no. Why not? Because it's an absolute right. Okay. So the court says here is just an absolute right. You not only have to have it 100% use, but this is 100% 24-7. And if anyone impacts you in the slightest bit, 1%, right? Trespass, $100,000 punitive damages. If one get the case, it's a short case, like a page and a half long, but it's actually a very important concept. All right, so just show of hands, how many people agree with the holding of this case? God bless Texas. One, two, three, four. Okay, basically everyone. Easier. Here it does not agree. The holding the case. Okay, three people. Sir, why, why do you? It's okay. If anyone wants to put an anonymous reason, but you can't do. Sir, why, why do you not agree with the holding of the case? Okay, but what happens when someone's not willing to negotiate? So what should the court, what damages should the court have awarded here to make everyone everyone better off? What would the correct measure of damages have been? One dollar, right? So Coase theorem would say, all right, let's compensate the Jacques for their actual loss, which is one dollar, not a hundred thousand. Someone else had a hand up. That, that's it. Yes, sir. Why, why do you think this case is wrong? Economic development at some point becomes important to public policy. They're only helping themselves. It's not in the interest of society for this type of a case. Only right, so it's interesting, right? So someone mentioned when can the government take your land? There's something called takings, eminent domain. And if the government wants to do some property too. If the government wants to build a road, when I say property too, people just turn the ears off, right? When a government wants to build a road or a highway or a bridge, 
and your land is under it, under their constitution, the Fifth Amendment, the government has the power to take your land and to pay you for it, right? So the government can make roads, but this is not a power that's exercised very easily, right? People should not be having their property taken. Uh, Dave, was your hand up? Yeah. I was, I was just saying what I didn't like about the case is that the government is punishing and economically beneficial behavior that's, you know, um, kind of certifying these old people's kind of, you know, silly way of thinking. Ah! All right, you're next. I was just saying, where do you draw the line, though? Somebody knows the door is unlocked and it's really happening. What's the safe harbor doctrine? Do you say in towards the safe harbor doctrine? Remember this? Remember, are you saying yes or no? Remember in towards if you're if there's a um, if there's a storm, you can dock your boat in the harbor without paying a trespass. And actually, I experienced this once. So I, I you know I never thought about it, but once I was in Pennsylvania and um, I left my car in a parking lot and I came back and the windshield wipers had frozen over. You wouldn't know about this, but when you turn your wipers on, the frozen the blades just fall off. <laughs> so this was really bad, and it was snowing blizzard, you know, it was freezing, like maybe five degrees out. So I, I sent my man to drive to Walmart with my blowers on, right, just trying to keep the snow off, and I bought a pair of wiper blades. And try and sell a pair of wiper blades in the snow, it's impossible. So you know what I found? I found a drive through bank that was closed. But I drove through the drive through bank, and I parked under the little canopy, and I was able to install the blades there. So I committed a trespass, the bank was closed. But I will gladly evoke the safe harbor doctrine at that point. So. <laughs> But I think you do raise a good point, right? I, I think David made, made, a, made a fair point. David said, we should reward the more economically efficient activity, right? It, it's more beneficial to society for these people to drive their trailer across. But who decides? Who decides which is more beneficial? Property rights or economically efficient, uh, beneficial? Ma'am, what do you think? Why? I want to be able to do with my property what I want to do. Ooh, this is this, this sick uterine. I'm not going to spell the entire thing. But this is this maxim. You can Google it. It's long in Latin. But it begins sick uterine. And it basically means I can do with my property as I choose so long as I don't harm anyone else. Anyone ever hear that before or something related to it? This is the maxim that informs majority opinion. I can do whatever I want on my land so long as I don't impact anyone else. Matthew, is that possible to do something in your land without impacting someone else? Is it even conceivably possible? No. Why not? By definition, you're excluding other people. Yes. Every case we've done this semester has involved one person using land in a way that harms someone else, or using some sort of property interest in a way that harms someone else. Every case with the ducks, with the uh, with the foxes, with the organs, right? The only way you can use property is to your benefit and invariably that harms someone else. Well, let's go back to the question then. If property is so harmful, why do we protect it? Don, I think your hand was up in the back. Did they lose, they lose the thread? Why, why do we, and this relates back to the point, why do we protect property if we can have more ben economically beneficent ways without protecting it? Right. So uh, when the government doesn't enforce property rights, the government has less incentive itself to invest in roads and stuff, right? Well, let's go back to the question I asked. Your answer presupposed that the bundle of sticks is correct, right? You all believe me, you suckers, that, that this is the correct way of structuring society, right? Why do we protect property? Oh, I think your hand was up. Why, why do we have these sticks? Why can't we just say we, we do what benefits the commonwealth? We don't focus on individuals. Why, why do we have these sticks? I was going to say, if they had gotten injured or had 
the mobile home had fallen over and people had died on their property because they were trespassing, mm -hmm. like they knew that they were going to do that or had the intention of going across their land and the property owners could be liable for these damages or these people dying because mm -hmm. just because they were using the land. So um, kind of owning property can deter people from Okay, good. Housing. Dustin, your hand up? So often ties the ability to kind of plug your own path in line. You can't protect your ability to keep and transfer into the exclusive group because it is a path on how you can advance yourself. Sure. Why do we have property? Why do we have this stupid bundle of sticks? I was going to say because um, individual property rights create the necessity to lean on the government to enforce those rights. And when you are Dependent on the government to enforce those rights, that that leads to less people enforcing their own rights and their own. But didn't we study that that government that property presupposes government? Wasn't the entire point of Pearson v. Post saying there were no laws on this? Why do we have? Why do we have Bill? Why do we have this bundle six? Why is this something society decides to do? Ah, so what? What? Why do we have the rule? Of, why did the dissent in Pearson versus Post say we should give the fox to the hunter? Why did the dissent in Pearson versus Post say we should reward the hunter, not the jerk? Create incentives, right? I was going to say that I think that enforcing um, property rights probably does more for the economy because it makes people ah. take negotiations and more seriously, and there's more of a chance. So, so did everyone watch the Olympics the other night? The opening ceremonies, and what did NBC call it? A noble experiment, communism? What? No, they called it a pivotal experiment. Yes, that was it. So NBC called communism, which killed more people than Hitler, a pivotal, a pivotal. What was the word? Yeah, a pivotal social experiment. Right? It was an experiment, sure as hell. But what did they experiment in? They eviscerated property rights. Okay, communism unbundled the stick. They gave all the sticks to the state. Any property right you had was derivative from the state, and they owned it outright. No one owned their apartment; they held it at the leisure of the state. No one owned their land or their crops or their fruits, their labor; they held it at the leisure of the state. Okay, what are the downfalls? Of this, of this pivotal social experiment, of course. No incentives. No incentives. Yeah, oh, there were, of course, incentives because there was so much corruption that if you work for the government party, you can get money and, and food and you know toilet paper for your family. But for the most part, you know, social problems, right? But for the most part, for the most part, when you have no property rights, you have no incentives. When you can't use your property in the way you want, you have no desire to keep it in a good state. When you can't sell your property, you have no incentive to improve on it to raise the value. When you can't exclude someone from your property, you have no incentive. So for example, squatting rights, we'll say this in property too, but this is a very big problem in many countries. Because if you go for vacation for a weekend, someone might show up in your apartment, you can't get rid of them. This is a legitimate problem, right? It's a big problem. So this pivotal social experiment failed for a lot of reasons. But one of which is the inability to have property rights. Even look at Cuba now. Raul right? Castro, under the new regime, is actually starting to allow property rights. People can actually buy their apartments. They can sell their apartments in limited, in limited contexts, right? And he's trying to institute these market reforms, try to make the economy better. So I'm not necessarily endorsing one view or the other, although it's probably obvious what I think. But the, the issue is property rights can and do promote social welfare. And perhaps in this case, the calculus doesn't add up, right? You're awarding $100,000 for what was essentially a one-hour trespass. That might not make any sense. But the institution of property, right, this bundle of sticks in the home of every American, that's what the court was trying to protect here. I think that's why the jury...
got so pissed off and awarded a hundred thousand dollars. I think if, if if the jury came from this class, I think that would be the verdict very easily. Probably perhaps more if it was in Texas. Trey. I think that in this case it makes a lot of sense to award punitive damages because the jury would have been asked to make a decision if they wanted to award punitive damages. So I think that in this case it makes a lot of sense to award punitive damages because the jury would have been asked to make a decision if they wanted to award punitive damages. So I think that in this case it makes a lot of sense to award punitive damages because the jury would have been asked to make a decision if they the situation and that just says to anyone that go ahead and do what you have to do and get sued. It's better yeah. than listening to a person who owns the property. Right. So this opinion was about sending a message and saying, you know what, in this country we're gonna protect this bundle. Bill's your hand up? Yeah. But they said the jury can award within its discretion, right? Yeah. So this this you might not be aware of, but punitive damages are not obligated. And often a judge can find that punitive damages are wrong as a matter of law, right? They're wrong as a matter of law. And that's why the judge can set them aside. What the court said here is, in this case, property is so important, a court can award that level of punitive damages. Uh, I, think, I think they remanded it, and they probably would reinstate the punitive damages, if I had to guess. It's not in the case, but I'm guessing that's what happened. Questions on this one? Don, Jan? It what? What's you? I think if it ends up, I mean, hundred thousand dollars of the price of the property. If you insert somebody, neighbors on somebody, and they don't have adequate court space to get to that place that they live in in Wisconsin, I don't know how many million. Not many. <laughs> but it's like if you do one, but the other one, and then you're not improving the infrastructure. Right. So I mean, imagine the court came out the other way, right? Do you think any company that transports trailers in that state would ever again bother negotiating? They just take the dollar and say, go sue me. Sue me. This sends a message. And unfortunately, punitive damage is not just about punishment, but also sending messages. Okay. Questions about, um, about this case? Is that a hand? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Oh, so what well, your question is, the Jacques let some people on the land, but not others, like in the next case. Ah, that's my segue. Yes, like in the next case. So before I go to the 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 the, C, the, the State v. Shack case, did did anyone change their minds about the right to exclude from being the first case to the second case? Anyone? Raise your hands. <laughs> Okay, did anyone like, maybe not change your mind, but, but shift their thinking from the first case to the second case? Okay, that's, that's why they're in that sequence, right? That, that's why I like this book because it, it puts two cases that make you think about the concept in a totally different way right next to each other. So let's talk a little about this case. Um, this is actually a very, a, a very sad topic. Has anyone actually done any work with migrant workers? I just, student, yes? Anyone? I just seen the last semester actually volunteer with a bunch of migrant workers in, uh, in, the, in, in the valley of Texas, so she had some good stories. Um, so this case is actually involving a situation in New Jersey that's not dissimilar from the uh, Georgia Indian case, right? So you had, here, here, here's an article from the, um, where is it? You have, um, here's the article from the Times. So you have a situation. So you have a, a labor, um, a labor, a, a farm in New Jersey. And the defendant, this is a Mr. Tedesco, um, allows migrant workers to come onto his farm. Okay? He hires them seasonally, right? As needed. Once they're on the farm, though, their mobilities are often limited. Okay? How are they limited? Well, they're effectively only paid for the days they work. And any days they're not working, they're not getting paid. So they effectively have to stay on the land. Um, the living quarters are really, really, really bad. They're in these, basically these, these bunks without any power, without any water, um, and in terrible conditions. There's really no access to medical care. There's not much access to you know, food. Um, usually their salaries are deducted for whatever food they do get. So, so these, are, these are really bad situations. Okay. So you have these two guys, Mr. Harris and Mr. Shack, okay? 
And this isn't clear from the case, but you might have figured that yourself. They wanted to get arrested. Did everyone pick up on that? This is what we call a test case, right? In the past, there have been issues where these people on this migrant, uh, on this farm, were not able to get access to various social services, you know, health care, uh, legal representation, etc. And if these people can't talk to human beings, they're effectively isolated, they're trapped. Okay? So Mr. Tedesco, the owner of the farm, okay? Oh, and how do I also know that this case was set up? Because when they came onto the farm, they came with a reporter from the New York Times with them. <laughs> That's when they got this nice picture there, right? In other words, the New York Times accompanied them to the farm. So there was one guy, Mr. Uh, uh, Harris, he was helping with health care. So the guy, Mr. Shaq, he was a lawyer. So they had a lawyer and a reporter with them because they wanted this to be documented. So what happened was Shaq and Harris go on the land, and then Tedesco goes, quote, I'll smash you for this. I'm going to get you for this. This is my property. You can't come in here looking around. Okay? So these are like the shocks, right? They're saying this is my property. Now, were they actually trying to go into the property or were they trying to talk to people onto his property? So this is a right to exclude and a right to include in one. In other words, Mr. Shack wants to be able to, I'm sorry, Mr. Um, uh, uh, Tedesco wants to be able to include the workers, but exclude these, these people trying to help them. And it's funny, another farmer told the reporter, quote, even a President Nixon would not be allowed in. Okay? Another farmer said they would resort to violence to try to repel those trying to help the workers. Okay? He said, quote, this violence is going to snowball. And then someone else said, either Hitler or Stalin would have known how to deal with these migratory farm workers. Yeah. So, so these, weren't, these, weren't, these weren't the best people in the world. Okay? So the Times reports that the farmers were using the trespass laws to keep the migrant workers isolated. So think about this, right? We're not just talking about one big farm. There were different sections of the farm, right? So, so check this out. Right? So, so Jason can stay in this part of the farm. Hannah can stay here, right? And Tosh can stay at this part of the farm. I'm only giving them permission to stay at these respective parts of the farm. What happens if Tasha tries going there? She's trespassing. What happens if Jason tries going there? He's trespassing. So the owner of the farm was effectively allowed to keep them trapped in their own little quadrant of the farm by enforcing trespass laws for people who left their area. Think about that. Right? Your, your, your right of bodily movement has just been eliminated. Um, this is uh, uh, not, a, not a good situation at all. Uh, so they were, and also one other thing, they couldn't even talk to each other. So if you, you know, phones, right? So if he's only in that corner of the farm and she's on that corner of the farm, they can't even share information. So if you have this one guy injured here and this guy can maybe talk to a doctor, they can't even share information. This was effectively a way of separating them. Um, the Times also describes their living conditions, okay? Uh, there was only one flush toilet that was crawling with flies. Um, several men, I'm sorry, seven men slept in one room. The beds had no sheets or mattresses. It was lice. Uh, and the reason why Shaq entered the farm was that there was a report that a 19-year-old worker had suffered a cut on his hand. And as a result, he was unable to work. And if you can't work, you're just running negative debt because they charge you to live there. So uh, to Harris went to camp to pick up another uh, 36-year-old who had his face was slashed. And he had to go back to the hospital to have stitches removed from his eye. Okay. Uh, these numbers from the 1970s, where they made $9 a week for work. Uh, and a family of 12 slept in one small room with a bed with space for eight. And the camps had no running water. These were, these were very, 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 very bad situations. Um, uh, and to Harris, he worked for this group called a SCOPE, it was it the Southwest Citizens Organization for Poverty Elimination. And they tried to help various migrant workers. This is the entire Cesar uh, uh, Chavez, everyone? No? No, the, the Yes We Can thing, that, that's where it came from, not Obama. It's the, we made that up. Uh, si Se Puede, right? Anyway, that's, that's where it came from. Anyway, so they enter the farm. They try and help them out. Okay? After they enter the farm, okay, let's, let's go back to the, the, the lineup. Steve, tell me, after they enter the farm, what happened? These, these two guys enter the farm. Now, now, did the trooper want to write them up for it? No. So what did the trooper tell the, tell the guy? What, what did he ask him to do before he'd write them up? 
You, you got it, Eric? What, what did the trooper do before he actually wrote them up? What did he insist on? Josh, you got it? All right, what did he do? He filed a formal written complaint. All right, Steve, I'll ask you this question. Steve, why do cops ask him to file a complaint before they arrest someone? What, what do you think? You got a badge? I think that when they ask Yeah, why would a cop ask someone to file a complaint before they arrest him? No way it looks like it's on. The person was complaining, and the cop didn't exercise an arbitrary uh, uh, decision. Good, right? So the police here probably did not want to enforce this statute, right? He probably felt wrong that he's, get this, right? He's arresting the two people on Healthy's Migrant Workers, right? So I'm guessing this police officer did not agree with the Jacques about the absolute property rights, but they, fought, they filled out a complaint, and they, they arrested him, okay? So now, this is a very weird case. So, uh, uh, Eric, on appeal, did the government want to, I'm sorry, on appeal, did, did Mr. Tedesco, the owner of the farm, want to enforce this uh, trespass? Did he want to prosecute it? Uh, not what I was looking for. Josh, did, did Mr. Tedesco prosecute this appeal? Did he actually, like, show up in court? No. No, he didn't. Did the government show up in court? Did they defend this prosecution? No. Okay, so this, this is weird, right? Usually, when the, when the state prosecutes someone, right, and the conviction to convict in the trial court, and then the defendant appeals. Usually the government tries to affirm the conviction, right? Jeanette, was the government trying to affirm the conviction here? I know, wasn't it? Yes, exactly. Neither side wanted to pursue this. Mr. Tedesco didn't show up. The government took no position. Well, they showed up, but they didn't actually take a position on this. Usually, what happens if the government stops defending a thing? Uh, uh, I mean, usually what happens when the government decides not to defend a case? Dismissed, right? When the government no longer defends uh, an opinion, this happens all the time in courts, right? The government might confess there and say, well, we found some new evidence, and we no longer want to support this conviction. At that point, you vacate the conviction. So, Narmeen, why the hell did I ask you to read an opinion when neither side wanted to hear the case? Why? What, what, what was this case even about? This is a trick question, by the way. <laughs> why was this even a case? Why did I make you read? <laughs> oh, I know, but do courts just do this, like to, to write op-eds? I mean, you know, are courts in the business just expressing opinions? What do courts do? What are courts supposed to do, at least, except in New Jersey? What? What do courts do? What's the name of this case? And what is the court trying to resolve between state and shack? Who trespassed, right? Courts resolve cases with two parties. Shack trespassed. The state prosecuted him for it. A court decides who's correct. Is it the state or shack? What happens when the state New Jersey has no interest in this case. Natasha, how can a court resolve a case when neither party wants to be there? <laughs> Shouldn't they just dismiss the case and go home? Okay. So this is only slightly exaggerating. This is a Jersey thing, okay? So the, <laughs> it is. So the New Jersey Supreme Court in this era was extremely, uh, shall I say, aggressive, okay? They would often reach out to issues not before them to make broader policy points. We'll study several of their opinions throughout the course of Prop 1 and Prop 2, but this court was notorious for doing this. It's abundantly clear that they want to resolve this issue. 
even though none of the parties wanted to be there. Here's what should have happened, right? The state says, we no longer agree with this conviction. Let's send it back to the trial court, vacate Mr. Shaq's conviction, and let him go free. Now, uh, uh, Tiffany, do you think Mr. Shaq wanted that to happen? Why not? Because he was there for a reason. Why was he there? Um, he was there to help the workers. He wanted to set a precedent. He didn't, he didn't come with a reporter just for the fun of it. He wanted to make a big media case. And this made the, the New York Times, right? It was on page A1 maybe or... Uh, yeah, right there. He wanted to make a case out of this. So the New Jersey court obliged. And they basically ruled on a case without any case or controversy. You'll, you'll learn this about... You, you'll study in Connell what a case or controversy is? I'll say this later. He's, he, there was no actual case to resolve, but the court did it anyway. So this is Jersey whatever. Okay? Everyone get the posture, because the posture is weird. If you're confused by it, you should have been. Yes? Tedesco, I meant. Yeah, Tedesco was the farm, the owner of the farm. He didn't want to be there either. Because, I mean, do you really think Mr. Tedesco wanted to be in court where all of his evil practices became known to the entire state? I mean, he might be all well and good yelling at a reporter, but when he's in court, that, that's a big deal. All right, so, so first, Sam, did the court... Talk about the constitutional issues here. Hmm. James, what do you think? Did the court talk about the constitutional issues? What does that mean? Actually, my notes, I have what, what WTF does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> what does it mean that the constitutional claims are not established by a definitive holding and it's unnecessary to explore their validity? What, what, what's going on here? Close. Well, the statute. So what the court's saying here is we don't need to resolve the constitutional issue. We can resolve this on more narrow grounds. Right? They're not interested in actually impacting the Constitution. So when David before asked me, can the government trespass on land? The answer is, constitutionally, no, they can't. They need a warrant, or they need some sort of statute that gives them permission to do so, and that statute has to have some sort of compensation attached to it. So the court ducks the Constitution. They're very good at that in New Jersey also. They ignore the Constitution, right? And they focus in on statutes and state law. Okay? So, uh, uh, Gwyn, what... What under state law has the court resolved this case? What are they looking at? Okay. Now, what's interesting, uh, and I'll ask this to Olu, they say, okay, that we have a trespass statute, right? But the trespass statute wasn't intended to cover government workers trying to help people, right? Is that exception anywhere in the trespass statute? Louder? It's not. Where did the court get this exception from? Oof, yeah. I don't know. I don't, they, they don't tell us. Um, Jeremy, where did we study before in this very class? where you take a simple statute that's been around forever and you start reading exceptions into it. Our second class, third class. Yeah, uh, Adam? In our third class. Which, 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 which story do we read that's discussing reading exceptions into statutes? Louder? Which one? Not the Will case. It's Blunkian, right? Remember the murder statute, right? Did the murder statute have an exception for self-defense? No. Did they say we're going to read the self-defense exception to the law? Yes. Here they do the exact same thing. They say, under state law, we have this trespassing statute, which has probably been around for 200 years, right? That says if you go on someone else's land, you commit a trespass. Black letter law. But there is a, an exception for government workers trying to help migrant workers. 
Is that it? I mean, they say, quote, under our state law, the ownership of real property does not include the right to bar access to governmental services available to migrant workers. That's the holding, right? They read an exception to the trespass statute that says, your right to exclude does not contain the ability to kick out government workers helping these migrant workers. That, that, that's effectively the holding. So just for a moment, pause, right? Well, to me, I mean, it, it boils down to helping the people. I mean, it, it doesn't the individual have the right to, you know, have those services provided to them? And would the right of the property owner overrule the right of the individual to have that? Well, what, that's what, what, it seems like what did we study five minutes ago in the, in the Jacques case, Wisconsin? What was the holding there? Well, there it was more commercial and not needs of the individual human. Yeah, but, but the court like said if there's even a 0.1% reduction in the right to use, then it's trespass. But they're living there. But they're living there. Those people are living on that property. And don't doesn't the individual have a right to medical care and things in their home? And that, be rental good. And that, that's the issue here, right? So just compare from it, right? In Wisconsin. They found a trespass for $100,000 by driving a freaking RV across a snow plant, you know, snow field for, for an hour. And here, the property owner said, okay, same. So there is a human aspect to it, right? There's a human aspect because perhaps these people need access to this care. Jeanette, was your hand up? Yeah, I'm just going to say, I've I read into that as well, that it wasn't so much the property they were talking about as it was the people on the property. That they didn't have an absolute right to the people. They didn't have dominion over the people. Mm. So, so, so maybe we could put this in terms of our sticks, right? They maybe had a right to exclude, but the right to include people meant other people can come up to help them. That's our hand in the back. Yes. <laughs> There, there are hints of that in the opinion, yeah. There's certainly hints of that in the opinion. that they. I'm sure the court views as almost a form of modern-day slavery. I'm sure that, that was part of the opinion. But think about it this way, right? How much do we have to allow onto our property, right? Now, the court's opinion here is very, very narrow. All they say is you have to allow government workers helping services to migrant workers, right? <clears throat> what else would be allowed to your property? What if, say, I don't know, someone wants to open a school on this property for some of the children living there? What do you think? Could they, could, could they come on and open a school? Oh, give me an answer. You're a lawyer. No, open a school, not just survey the land. Oh, oh, open and staff a school on, on this guy's property right next to the uh, farmhouse. Right. What about Dustin? What about opening, say, a church? Say the people that they need religious exposure. No, no. Kurt, what do you think? School or church? Yeah. But allowing government workers to come on to give benefits for you know, information for various health care. That's allowed? Yeah. Why? What's the difference there? What do you mean the scope? Scope of the usage. Um, so you're living here, and you want to allow you to do things to use. that scope allow you so the question is how much of an infringement someone else's right to use is a state willing to do? So the question is, is our humanitarian commitment to these people going to trump property mm -hmm. rights? Would anyone think that, yeah, you could open a school or a church there? Yeah. Why? On whose land? <laughs> How far would that limit go? So what's the reason? What's your limiting principle? People who need schools for necessities. They're sure they're... they're <laughs> Done. 
Well, a funny story. So this actually happened in Dallas so this morning, right? So a related issue um, in a Dallas, right? In in a private house, a rabbi opened up a synagogue just in his house, and the neighbor is actually suing for a loss of property value with all these people coming and going. Can you use your house to to, to build a synagogue? He says it bothers them. It's too much traffic. Well, not much traffic on Friday night, but you know there's there's a lot of traffic as a result of this. Kyra, Kyra, I think your hand was up. Lose your hand up. Oh yeah, I was saying that I think the case ties back to people's well-being is the primary concern. Um, schools and churches, sadly to say, it doesn't tie back to the basic necessities of life. And I think that these people were weren't get, they were not getting the basic necessities. James. I think it comes down to the, uh, the court mentioned that they're disadvantaged. <clears throat> so yeah. To, So, I mean, if you study that pivotal social experiment from the Soviet Union, it was based on a theory of Marxism, which basically said that capitalism uses a tool of oppression, right? That private property is used as a tool to oppress. And that's not usually my beliefs, but this might be a case where that principle might be fairly clear. That this farmer was using trespass laws not only to keep these workers out, and try to keep these, you know, these, these relief workers out, but to keep the farmers within. And uh, you know, there's lots of discussion about the value of the free market and aspects where free market rights break down. Um, but this might be a case where property rights might trump. There's actually readings by Richard Epstein, who uh, it's in the case afterwards, uh, who's a, a genius, who knows everything. This guy's a really smart guy. Um, but but he actually speaks of in cases where you have these great disparities in power. Where one group has much more power than the other. It's effectively a monopoly, right? That the uh, farmer here monopolizes over the of the workers. And this might be a case where the government can step in to break down property rights and to perhaps not eliminate the entire bundle of sticks, but maybe just take one of the sticks out, or maybe chop a stick in half. That you can exclude people, but not everyone. Maybe you have to let some people in. Yes, ma'am. You're asking me. I'm not giving you an answer. It's too easy. Where do you think it stops? It's too easy. Now, where do you think it stops? I mean, where? How, how do we draw the balance, right? I mean, what the court says here is that quote rights are relative, and there must be an accommodation. That you know this old maxim. This uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll this. It's actually sic utere tuo ut alienum non liedis. Yeah, I can never spell it. L e a d s, which basically means use what is yours so as not to harm others, or use your property in such a way that you don't damage others. Right? The court says that this law doesn't really apply. That the very aspect of Mr. Tedesco using his farm this way of keeping these people out is harming others, right? It is oppressing these people. I saw another hand somewhere. Yes? That's why, because this, that's why this case in the book, because it's really easy to see the harm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what's the harm here, right? 
his ability to manage the farmers in this way is making them injured. They can't help themselves. They can't even leave the farm to get uh, access to any health health care. So I think there are here palpable harms. Go back to the Jacques case a few minutes ago, right? Was there any harm? Not really. David. And then, like, you know, we can say that, like, the harm is like, relegated to the farm workers themselves, but ultimately, like, they're a burden on the state, too. Mm -hmm. So, like, it affects everyone. Well, if the farmer had his way, they wouldn't be a burden, right? What the farmer is effectively doing is cutting them off from any social services. Sure. Right. In other words, these, do, uh, 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 Shaq and um, uh, to Harris, they were trying to give them services. So until they actually got there, there was actually no burden. Yes? Okay. Let me give you another example. This is... <laughs> The magic school bus, I don't even know what we'll get there. <laughs> right, let me give you another example, right? This is actually a Supreme Court case, right? You have a store inside of a shopping mall, right? Can a shopping mall exclude protesters? What do you think, uh, uh, Gabriel? Could a shopping mall exclude protesters? Um, Yeah, that's right. So this might shock you, right? But there's actually a Supreme Court case here. That if you have a mall that's open, people can come and go as they please, there's no admission price, there's no exclusion. If it's generally open, you can't exclude protesters. Does that strike one as odd? So we've gone from you can't drive across this massive field of snow to we have these poor people on this farm to you have the Galleria and you have these protesters protesting whatever, they can't be kicked out. I mean, if they're being noisy or obnoxious, yes, but if they're silently protesting with signs, they can't kick them out. Anyone, anyone struck by that? Nope. At a mall, they can't? As long as they're quiet. If they're being obnoxious, right? So, for example, everyone's seen the Westboro Baptists. These are these uh, anti-preachers, like gays, right? Okay. You always see pictures holding up these, these signs. You ever hear them saying a word? Silent as a peep. They don't say a word. They just stand up and hold the signs and look very angry. <laughs> I actually I went to the Supreme Court the day before that case was argued, um, and I didn't meet one of their guys, but I met a guy from a different church. There's actually a video of an interview on YouTube if you want to watch it. But, but these, these are fascinatingly disturbed people. Uh, these, these, are, uh, these, these are... If you want to, if you want to just Google them, it's really difficult to watch. But they rely on trespass laws and their ability to freely protest. Yes, ma'am. Sit there and what? Snow. That's what I thought you said. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, the entire Occupy movement was they went to Zuccotti Park in New York and other places, and they just sat there for months. They occupied the parks. Hand up someone else. So this entire issue of the right to exclude, just keep this in the back of your mind as we go through the semester because much of what we're doing is about defining who owns property and when. And invariably, all of it is saying if she owns it, that means she can't own it. It's about excluding someone else. Anyone else? Have a good night. See you later.